Hi, Tony. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi, Tony. Hi. Is, is there a raw material bottleneck on the um, future that you're, you're telling us about? Is there a raw material bottleneck? Okay. Not to my knowledge. Um, I have spoken. There, there are companies that do these things, um, benchmark mineral. There are companies that track the whole supply chain of lithium ion and, and so on and so forth. And to my knowledge, uh, no. I mean, not, not not so nobody has told me that there is in the no, industry. If there's no raw material, if there's no raw material bottleneck, what are the what is the the bottleneck for this future then? So thanks. Um, so what is the bottleneck for this future? Um, regulation. Um, you know, there's pushback from um, not in New Zealand, of course, but uh, <laughs> but in many countries around the world and in many states in the United States. There has been a big, a big pushback from the incumbents. Uh, I'll give you an example. You can't buy a Tesla in Texas. <laughs> you just can't, right? Uh, if you want a Tesla in Texas, you have to buy it online, and somebody has to drive it to you. So uh, essentially, the legislature doesn't allow Tesla to have stores in Texas, right? And that's not the only place. New Jersey was like that too, and they're in the process of changing and so on, right? Um, that's on the EV side. On the solar side, um, you know, there are states like Arizona where the utility has pushed really hard for a solar tax. Solar tax, right? The sun is free, sunshine is free, right? So, so the utility has pushed the, 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 the Public Utility Commission which should be called the Utility Commission in Arizona, um, to essentially charge 50 bucks a month for anyone who has solar panels. Now, the, the PUC there approved only like $7.50, but it's still a solar tax, right? So these are just two examples of how the existing, the incumbents are pushing back against electric vehicles and against solar and so on. Right, we've got another question. How do you factor in the autonomous or the Google car? Autonomous cars. So thank you for that question. Um, so I said that the electric vehicle is essentially a computer on wheels. Um, if you bought a Tesla a year ago, you've been downloading software over the last year every time you charge. Um, now you have a car that's 90% autonomous. Okay, so actually that's one of the disruptive uh, uh, features of, of, of electric vehicles. Um, it, they improve with time as opposed to, you know, they break down with time. Um, your car does. Um, uh, so a Tesla Model S now is 90% autonomous. Um, they can't use all of those features, again, because of regulation. Um, but essentially, self-driving car technology has improved also on an exponential rate. And let, let, me, let me give you examples. Um, if you've seen the Google car, that, that thing, that sensor that it has on top that goes like this, that's called LIDAR, which stands for laser and radar. So it emits a million pulses per second that come back as a radar does, right? But it's 360, so you have a 360 view. So LiDAR in 2012 was $70,000. And of course, a lot of people said what when, when, when they looked at this? Not gonna happen, right? Not anytime soon. By 2013, LiDAR was $10,000. This year, there's a startup company in Silicon Valley that has built a LiDAR equivalent for $1,000, $1,000, okay? So essentially the technologies for self-driving car have gone down on a super exponential curve to the point that uh, they're not gonna be more, I mean, uh, self-driving cars are not gonna be much more expensive, maybe a couple thousand dollars, than, than um, you know, your standard EV. But then EV companies are saying that they're gonna put LiDAR in all their cars, right? Because they're all gonna be 
autonomous or semi-autonomous. Now, um, every single one of these companies tells me that um, the technology is ready, that, that, that you can, in fact, have a self-driving truck, a self-driving car. At Stanford, we're talking to a company to have Stanford. Who, who's been to Stanford? Uh, yeah, a good number. You know how large Stanford is. I mean, it's huge. You can't walk from one end to another. So at Stanford, we have a shuttle that goes around the campus, and this is all it does. One goes like this, and one goes like that. So we're talking to a company to do a self-driving shuttle this year. Basically, it's going to go around campus this year. So the technology for self-driving cars is already there. Uh, the cost has come down dramatically. Um, so think about this. Technology, so a self-driving car is not more expensive than an EV, essentially. Um, so let's think about business model innovation. Does anyone use Uber? Anyone? Oh, there you go. Now imagine Uber with a self-driving car. Okay? So if you have car sharing and Uber, today we, like I think I mentioned, um, we park our cars 96% of the time. That's such a waste of money. A car is our second largest asset, right, after our home. We spend 30, 40, 50 grand on an asset to keep it parked 96% of the time. It makes no sense. Now, imagine that instead it was self-driving and it was going around 90% of the time, right? What will happen then? Essentially, you'll have mobility on demand. It can take you from anywhere to anywhere at any time at a tenth of the cost, at a tenth of the cost because it has 10 times the utilization. Um, so the whole concept of car ownership goes away, right? Who is going to want to own a $50,000, $40,000 car when for a tenth of that, you can have essentially the same service, right? And so that is the business model for self-driving car. It's essentially car sharing. And that is not that far away. Uber is now working with Carnegie Mellon University to build its own self-driving car, okay? So what happens when you combine car sharing with self-driving cars? Car ownership goes away. We need 80% fewer cars, maybe 90% fewer cars, because you know they go around all the time instead of being parked. We don't need 80% of parking, especially in the downtown areas. Who needs parking when cars are going around all the time, right? In fact, who needs a garage in your house? Maybe you can reuse that garage on Airbnb, right, and start making money instead of, you know, park your car there. So the model, the business model for self-driving car is car sharing. It's gonna be a tenth of the cost. They're gonna go around all the time. They're gonna be electric. Um, and essentially it's gonna make car ownership obsolete. So within 10, 15 years, we're not going to need to own a car. Um, your kids, kids born today, will never drive. Kids born today will never drive, right? Because of that, that that's an even bigger revolution than the EV itself. And that's, what's the, that's the answer to the, what's gonna happen with self-driving cars.